On Larry King now, genetically modified organisms, they're pervasive in our food supply. Are they safe for us to eat? Every serious science academy in the world have all said that genetically engineered foods are just as safe as foods that are produced conventionally. What about the There smiling. were doctors and there were professors that went out and said there was nothing wrong with tobacco smoke either. Mm -hmm. And then we later found out that it caused cancer. That's there have been countless studies about GMO foods and the idea that you know certain animals have had very adverse effects to GMO foods. Quite so, honestly, that is the biggest bunch of nonsense well, that I've ever heard. I think you're, my entire what you're saying career. is nonsense. Plus, if an insect won't eat it and, and a bird won't eat it, you should be afraid. <laughs> All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. Today we are talking about genetically modified organisms in our food, also known as GMOs, biotech foods, transgenic crops, genetic engineering, and to some detractors as frankenfoods. In 2012, 88% of the corn crops in the United States were genetically modified, as well as 93% of soy. And each year, the presence of GMOs in America's food supply increases. Is this a welcome scientific advance or a danger to our health? Here to discuss this issue, Curtis Stone, chef, New York Times best-selling author, TV personality, and now restaurateur. Uh, Curtis recently opened his first restaurant, Maud, where he focuses on seasonal, locally sourced ingredients. Maud opened to the public February 1st in Beverly Hills. Mary Lou Henna, the New York Times best-selling author and actress, currently hosts the nationally syndicated Mary Lou Henner Show, a longtime health and wellness advocate. She's one of the few private citizens selected to contribute to the reshaping of the government's food pyramid. Professor Bob Goldberg is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and professor of molecular biology at UCLA, named one of the top 20 professors in the school's history. He's been using genetic engineering in his research for the past three decades. And my old pal John Sally, wellness advocate, TV host, NBA champion. John is currently working with the Los Angeles school system as its health and wellness guru and will be joined as the show progresses by a variety of guests in other locations on both sides of the issue. Let's start first with, uh, with Dr. Goldberg. Professor, what is, G what is a GMO? We're talking about inserting genes in organisms for which essentially they weren't born with. It's a very powerful technique, but it's an old technique. How old? 40 years. 40 years. Did four someone decades. invented? Yeah, it was invented in 1973. <laughs> November exactly. the 23rd. November the 23rd. <laughs> and its purpose was? The purpose was to, originally to be able to study the genes and the biology of living organisms. And it's led to a tremendous revolution in biology, a tremendous revolution in biotechnology. So you see no negative to it? I, you know, you can't always say that there's, there's a negative, but I think you need to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. There's no question that genetic engineering over the last 40 years has saved hundreds and hundreds of millions of lives. In it's the food that. area, has it improved the food? We oh, it's been tremendous improvement in agriculture, uh, particularly in the developing world. There's been tremendous studies done by the United Nations and the Food and Agriculture Organization. And we modify it in order to? Well, we've been modifying foods for 10,000 years. In order to? In order to improve make them its safer. yield. Not necessarily make them safer, although they are safer, but to increase yield, to allow them to grow, we, us to grow more on less land, to reduce the amount of pesticides, to reduce the amount of fertilizer, to save soil, and to make them more nutritionally balanced. Okay, let's get into the panel, Curtis. What, what's the rub? Look, I mean, as soon as you start messing around with food, um, I think that you need to have a long um, research process that goes into the effects of, of what, what we're doing with the food. So when, when it comes to genetically modifying the ingredients that we use, um, I really think that you mentioned it's been happening for a long time. 40 years to me isn't a long time. You know, most of us sitting around this table have been living longer than that and we've been eating food for centuries. 
I think that where that research comes from is really important and who it's funded by is really important. You know, when you look worldwide, there's over 60 developed countries. You mentioned developing countries, but the developed world has a very different perspective on it than what the US has. 60 countries throughout the world have either uh, very strict restrictions or total bans on GMO. Yes. When you say companies, are you say there's something sinister going on here that these companies are making products that they want to be used in this? Well, when you, when you look at the labelling, you know, of course, the, the big companies that use genetically modified ingredients don't want labels because we know that 53% of Americans would choose not to purchase GMO um, uh, products and 91% of Americans want it labelled. but Would choose not to purchase it. Would choose not to purchase it. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Why, I think that uh, you cannot stop people wanting to know what's in their food, demanding more information, wanting to protect their children more. And the idea that there would be a company that would spend $7.1 million just to keep Proposition, Proposition 37 off of, you know, the California legislature, then you can imagine that they've got a vested interest. What That's does that Monsanto. Say? It says that they don't want the labeling on their food because people feel this way. You you can't stop people from wanting to have the information. There have been countless studies in many, many, many different countries about GMO foods and the idea that, you know, certain animals, whether it's hamsters, whether it's pigs, whether it's, it's rats, whatever, have had very adverse effects to GMO foods. And so we don't want to see our kids. Now, we are breaking down. We are not as hardy as we used to be, and the generation coming up is probably going to be the first generation that doesn't live as long or as healthy as their parents. But we're living longer. We're living longer, but our kids are not. And the thing is, well, every I'll stat have I have read. Bob, yeah. you're going to okay. get a chance. You're outmanned here. I know. I'm so I will, up on you. I will yeah. stick up. No, He's a simple professor here. No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> is the public worried about this, John? I, I, the public is, is really, really not informed properly. Uh, here in California, she just mentioned the proposition to have us know what the labeling is. They said no to the labeling. They paid for us to say no, we don't want people, it's going to cost more money. If we put labels on, it's going to cost more money to the public. And it's unconstitutional. Right. That was the other but thing you mentioned. if you're a porn star, you have to use a condom. We're going to vote for that. <laughs> We're going to vote for what you have to do over there, but we're not going to vote for what's in our food. We're going to vote for what's on But top. aren't you impressed? With this professor, I'm, I'm one of so the impressed. most, impressed one of the like 20 out. most distinguished ever, <laughs> he is. who he tells is. you it's okay. Yeah, but this is the funniest thing. Um, he is a professor at UCLA, and he and, and I think you're a wonderful man. I'm going to do some you research up on. I'm going to do <laughs> some research you. on it. But one of the things that I do know is that I'm seven foot, and I do know that Yao Ming is from China. He's seven seven, and I do know that kids are getting bigger, and I do know that I have right now four kids at 14 years old that are 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. And that cannot be from eating healthy food. No. Oh, but it has, our little but girls. it has absolutely nothing Our to do kids. with GMO. Yeah, yeah it has everything it has to do with GMO. No, it doesn't have anything to do with GMO. Everything, because everything that they eat, you just said it's 90% of the food is GMO. No, I didn't say that. All right, let me get it right. I don't know why we need other people, because this panel could go for hours. But coming up, we'll be joined by Chipotle's chief marketing officer, Mark Crumpacker to discuss the company's unique stance on GMOs. We'll be right back. We're now joined by Mark Crumpacker. He's the chief marketing officer of Chipotle. Since it was founded in 1993, Chipotle has opened more than 1,600 locations, and my two children go to two of them every day. <laughs> OK. Mark, you have heard the opening of the discussion. What is the Chipotle position on GMOs? So Chipotle's stance on, on GMOs is that uh, we, we don't believe there's a scientific consensus that they're safe, either for human consumption or animal consumption. And until we believe such a consensus actually exists in the scientific community, we feel it's best not only to disclose that we have some GMOs on our menu, but then to make a concerted, concerted effort to remove all of them to the extent possible from our menu. Uh-huh. So we, there, there's no GMOs at Chipotle, or there are, and we, you have to live with them? Well, there, there are GMOs at Chipotle. About uh, you know, a year ago, in March of 2013, we decided to disclose what GMOs uh, were on the menu. And as we looked into it, we found that there were a couple of culprits. One was a soy oil, which is used in a few different uh, things at Chipotle. 
and you know usually to lubricate a pan or as an ingredient in something. Um, and then you know our corn uh, and flour tortillas there was some were some GMOs. So we fairly quick, quickly were able to eliminate the soy oil and switch to sunflower and rice bran oil. So that eliminated the GMOs from almost everything on the menu. The only remaining items are uh, the corn and flour tortillas. The corn tortillas and chips are actually obviously made of corn, so we're finding non-GMO corn for those. And there's a little bit of corn starch uh, in the flour tortillas, so we're on, in the process of removing that. So by the end of 2014, we expect all of our ingredients at Chipotle to be non-GMO. Okay, Bob, why is he and this panel wrong? Yeah, because it's not based on science. It's based on a uh, concerted, uh, frankly depressing, anti-science campaign that's been going on for well, 10 conducted by who? years. Uh, it's been a concerted campaign by people who feel that natural is better, back to nature is better, organic is better, and that's not necessarily true because the science doesn't bear it out. Every serious science academy in the world, the National Academy of Sciences, the Royal Society, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, American Medical Association have all said that genetically engineered foods are just as safe as, thing, as foods that are produced conventionally. What about the American Academy of Environmental Medicine? What about uh, some of the other countries that have gotten involved? What about uh, just seeing that we have more allergens, more autism? And since 1973, November the 23rd, we have we are become much sicker. That that kind of research isn't even long enough for us to be you know, able Mary, to tell. Quite honestly, and I can show quite honestly, that is the biggest bunch of nonsense well, that I've ever heard. I think you're, my entire what you're saying is career. nonsense. There's 1,700 peer-reviewed publications that state that. These plants funded that are by because made, they want to, funded by and because they National want to keep Science playing. Science Foundation, U.S. Department of Agriculture. The they European, want to keep playing second. in their the Euro, laboratory. Wait a second. Of the course. European Food Safety Organization, European, spent a half a billion dollars over the last ten years, and just published a report done by scientists at institutions and universities all over Europe. They did more studies on these foods than anyone could ever imagine, and they concluded that there's no documented safety hazard to genetically but modified plants. Uh, as but as why, why, is why is there such the a problem with labeling it? There. Why is there such a problem? Uh, yeah, why are why? people spending so much money to protect? Yeah, so well, so that, right. if, okay, if That's it's so, so wonderful, so not me, why aren't so we allowed in, to label? So let me just, in the sense of full disclosure, say that I wrote the arguments against labeling for Proposition 37 on the California ballot. Because and there were two reasons why I felt very strongly about it. One, I feel strongly about the technology, because I think we really need this technology, because we're facing. So you think if you label it, people won't buy it. Exactly. So or you think when it's labeled, people will react and negative secondly, because it's labeled. And the second reason is that you label things because of what the product has. You don't label a process, and genetic engineering is a process. And what we do in my lab, and in literally thousands of labs across the world is no different than what's been done for 10,000 years. If I make a big tomato in my lab, which I don't, but if I did by adding a gene, that's the, exactly the same gene that was used in conventional breeding to make a big tomato. Do you have that's genetically it. modified food? Absolutely not. None in your restaurant? None. Mark, can we yeah. say, this is a little reverse psychology here. Is Chipotle saying, we're gonna be smart and say that people fear GMOs so we're going to plug the fact that we don't have them or have very little of them so that more people will come to us based on their fear of the other foods. The reason we want to remove GMOs from our menu is that we don't agree that there's a scientific consensus that, there's a, that they're safe. Just because a study is peer-reviewed doesn't mean that it's accurate. Um, we, you know, the, the, the long-term studies, and we're talking about long-term here, we're talking about very long-term, longer than any studies here have, have actually uh, spanned, and so we, we just don't agree with the fact that there's a, that there's a, con, a scientific consensus that they're safe. Um, there may not be yet evidence of, of particular health-related concerns. That doesn't mean they're safe. So at Chipotle, it's our goal to serve the very highest quality ingredients. 
And we just can't find the support to suggest that these ingredients are safe either for human consumption or, frankly, for the consumption of livestock used right. as meat. Yes, so when I go to a store now, I don't know if a food is... Well, if you get organic, it's not GMO. It's, it's, a, it's certified organic means it's not GMO. All right, Mark, thank you very much. You're uh, welcome. Monsanto is one of the biggest names in genetic engineering. In our next segment, we'll be joined by its executive vice president, Dr. Rob Fraley. Stay with us. We are doing two programs on this, a full hour devoted to it because it's so important. Joining us now, the panel remains, of course, is Dr. Robert Fraley. He's the executive vice president, chief technology officer of Monsanto. That's a leading producer of genetically engineered seed. Dr. Fraley is also the 2012 recipient of the World Food Prize, dubbed, by the way, the Nobel Prize of Food. You are a supporter of GMOs, right? Yeah, I'm a supporter as a, as a scientist who's been involved with it his whole career, as a dad who's got uh, three kids, and you know, as, a, uh, as a young man who uh, grew up on a farm in, uh, in the Midwest and uh, spent a lot of time thinking about agriculture and food production. I think these are, uh, are really important technologies, important tools as we think about uh, food production today, but even more importantly, think about the challenge of uh, producing you know, twice as much food in just a few years. Are you saying that when Monsanto got into this, you're making food healthier? Absolutely. Uh, you know, the technologies that I'm sure you've talked about with biotechnology are really an extension of the genetic modification and breeding techniques that, you know, man has been using since the beginning of time. And we've relied on that to, to produce, you know, the better crops, the better fruits and vegetables that have enabled us to have the kind of choices that consumers have today. And uh, these tools have helped farmers uh, here in the U.S. and around the world. And uh, they are uh, an important part of the arsenal as we think about producing more food, facing the challenges of climate change, and, you know, doubling the food supply. How much of the market does Monsanto control? Uh, you know, one of the things that makes that so uh, hard to answer is we've licensed our technology to hundreds of companies in the United States and around the world. And so various companies uh, use, uh, use some of the technology we've developed. From a pure seed perspective, if I just focus on the U.S., uh, our market share in corn and soybeans and vegetables is about 25 percent or so of the market. How much money have you given to the United States government in order to keep supporting Monsanto's GMO? And, uh, and how much did you spend uh, avoiding GMO labeling? Uh, a lot of questions there. So like a lot of companies, uh, we lobby on behalf of our farmer customers to make sure that, the, uh, that you know, the, their issues are understood and appreciated. I don't think there's anything unusual or atypical about, uh, about our lobbying efforts. In terms of the, uh, the food labeling, I think those numbers are, are very clear in terms of what the industry and what Monsanto contributed, you know, both in California and But in, how uh, much? Can you much? tell us how much uh, in uh, both cases? Because you didn't answer my first question. Uh, I, don't, I don't really have the specifics, but it's important. I'd be, uh, be happy to follow up with you. Wow. Okay. I got to <laughs> learn to do that. Do you know what? No. Uh, he could, that's like a curveball. Yeah, he but it's like a, a politician. And a slide. Yeah, right, for sure. Uh, Rob? But, What's wrong if they label it? Uh, not a thing. In fact, you know, I think it's a great starting point for the conversation because a lot of people think that we're against labeling. The reality of it is we've been very supportive of the voluntary labeling approaches that I think are really the true answer for labeling. And so, you know, voluntary labeling, whether it's uh, GMO-free or organic, which are two very popular labels, I think makes a lot of sense. And so, you know, the approach that companies like, uh, like Whole Foods or Chipotle or what we've seen recently, you know, with Cheerios is exactly the right way to label. Because, you know, if a company wants to develop and support and market a product and, uh, and get the, the marketing benefit or the perceived benefit of, uh, of a voluntary label makes complete sense to us. With all due respect, you're giving a very political answer and you're avoiding the question again. You're saying that you're supporting positive labeling, which means that companies do have the freedom to say we are GMO free, but what you're what you're, what you're eliminating in, in what you're saying is the fact that Monsanto supports 
not labelling. 7.1 million, yeah. Right, you've spent a lot of money saying, you know, going out and lobbying the government saying that you don't want GMOs to be labelled. No, Com the compulsory labelling of GMO and use and in, in processed foods. We'll have plenty of time for uh, dialogue and you know my style. I, uh, I uh, be absolutely uh, as direct and, and candid as, uh, as, as absolute I can be uh, because I've got a really strong passion about uh, food and food safety as we go forward. So first of all, from a point of view of mandatory labelling, which was the point that was being uh, debated both in California and Washington State, uh, we're against that. Uh, because mandatory labeling is an FDA decision. And if every state were to label their foods differently, I, I think it would really hurt farmers and the transport of food and uh, really create unnecessary costs. And it's really not, not essential because the voluntary labeling schemes for GMO We have other labeling. We have other labeling for things like organic. We have other labeling. Every single product that you buy since the late 70s has some kind of label on it. So why wouldn't you allow, uh, you know, GMO corn, GMO soy, GMO wheat, whatever So it's people going can to be. make informed decisions yeah. because there are the, people out there that don't want to buy GMO food. So why don't they, why, don't, why can't we give them the power to make an informed decision? They can make an informed decision by buying organic, which is labeled certified and is non-GMO. And I also think that this is really an arrogant conversation. Oh, because it's not all going, going your way. Because you're no. sitting here. Yeah. No, it's an, arrogant, it's an arrogant conversation because it assumes that the people of California that voted no for labeling were doing it because somehow Monsanto put a gun to their head. No, and but told they them certainly to do contributed. That. Dr. Goldberg and Dr. Fraley, how am I hurt by more information? You're not hurt by more information because I think more information is great. So why can't but, I know if a product but, has it or not has it? It's just here's information. The here's the problem with the argument. One can breed conventionally a plant that might be even more harmful to you than anything that we may or may not do using modern genetic engineering. Like what plant? Well, For example, so no conventionally grown crops have any testing or any regulatory oversight. The policy of the FDA is that conventional crops and genetically engineered crops are not any different from each other. And, and before I think it's the FDA logical. was bought by Monsanto and other Wait, special interest question. groups. So if you had on a organic food in front of you or genetically modified, yep. you would choose to eat the genetically modified because you feel it's better for you. No. Answer that question. Which one would you eat? Yeah, I have to answer it in saying I'm a scientist. I go by scientific data. There's a process here. It's not hocus pocus. It's not magic. It's Read the major study. Let me, study okay. let me get a break, guys. Got to get a break. Studies. Come right back. Well, Could GMOs help study. cure world hunger? We'll discuss the link between food insecurity and genetic engineering so with Dr. Fraley and our panelists right after the break. We're back. The 2013 UN report projects the world population will hit 9.6 billion by 2050. Uh, Rob, are GMO crops an answer to world hunger? I think they're one of the important answers. They're not the only tool, but they're a really critical tool. And, you know, they've already demonstrated the ability to reduce pesticides, increase yields. You know, they're grown now in 30 countries around the world but by tens of millions of farmers. And uh, they are an important tool, particularly as we think about producing food for a growing planet in the face of climate change and a lot of challenges for, uh, you know, doubling the food supply. But, but, there's, other, but has... there's other challenges as well. Absolutely. We have to be able to grow more food in the next 50 years than we have in the entire history of humankind. And we have to do it on less land much less land, which means we need higher yields <coughs> with much less resources, water, But we, but we should also be looking at how much money British, and time and yeah. space we're spending on Are animals. Are you saying that this is harmful? Well, look, I think... You're what, saying to people, don't eat GMO foods. I'm saying that I don't, saying that. I don't eat GMO foods because I'm I don't think an appropriate amount of research has been done on them. Let me, let's see we're talking about world hunger. Mm -hmm. Well, you're laughing, but let me tell I'm you something. There, there were doctors and there were professors that went out and said there was nothing wrong with tobacco smoke either. Mm -hmm. And then we later found out that it caused cancer. That's correct, okay. but a gene mm -hmm. is not tobacco right. smoke. Uh, well, okay, and a gene but, that we know the structure of is not tobacco smoke. So you're, and a gene you're, that we know where it goes But now you're putting the pesticides. You're not. putting, and how are we ingesting them? And our children research. are taking them. And you're them. telling me well, that me, because this scientific research hasn't shown that GMOs can be harmful, then they're, then they're safe. And I'm saying that's not the case. Well, I disagree then, with you. Then, if you disagree, 
They're disagreeing with every major scientific body that's not, By the, the way, world. that's not true. Well, but do you disagree no, with the National let, Academy let, of Sciences, let, the let, Royal let, Society, <laughs> the Australian which, Academy which of Sciences? Which they all have. Yes, they all want to play in their laboratory. And, and, yes, and, yes, wait a second. Interest. And over 2,000 peer-reviewed experiments that have not been of done course. by Monsanto and have not been done by by Syngenta have been done by Please academics. let me just address one thing. And you disagree with the European Food Safety Organization that said that they're perfectly safe. Rob, is your fear, and Bob, is that if it's labeled, people won't buy it? Is that your fear? No, my fear is that there's been a concerted 15-year campaign to demonize these kinds of foods and so this So your technology. fear is they won't buy it and if so they And so when I listen to Mary Lou, I hear very similar things to the climate deniers of the right. In face oh. of all the scientific Please, evidence, say that in face of all the scientific, in face of all oh the scientific gosh. evidence, they say no, the climate isn't changing. The climate isn't changing. The totally so in changing. face of all the scientific evidence, Curtis and Mary Lou are saying no, they're they're harmful. There may be problems and stuff. And so, therefore, you, you every science and every scientific society is wrong. Yeah, really. Excuse me. Arrogant. He says the scientific effort supports his position. And it supports that obesity has raised, risen. But it's not due to GMOs. In the past 10 years, 15 years, like you said. And that has nothing to do with GMOs. It does, because if 90% of the foods are GMOs, then it has to come from the food. As I explained, and I'm not going to get too pedantic or too professorial. Great work. Okay. Too late. The genetically engineered, let's say, soybean has a gene in it that in many cases is a plant gene which makes a protein that you eat every single day in either organic or non-genetically engineered vegetables. It's indistinguishable in chemical structure and therefore it's not going to have any of these effects that you have because you're eating it as it is. Secondly, the insect resistant crops that are made which reduce tremendously millions and millions and millions and millions of pounds of pesticides in the environment. This is something that has been used in okay. organic farming right. for over 75 years. Aren't you so that an insect it's in won't eat it? In us. If an <laughs> insect won't eat it, and, and a bird going into won't us. eat it, you should be afraid. <laughs> and Absolutely. it has been used in organic farming. And our children, farming it's so unfair. So, They're little 40 to 80 pound bodies. You know, this. when I listen to this conversation, um, and, and I mean this sincerely, I find it very, very depressing. It, uh, it we'll pick up on that. The topic is GMOs. Thanks, Dr. Fraley. Uh, and that ends part one of a two-parter of Larry King okay. Now. Thanks to my guests, Curtis Stone, 